think only people who don't have a love, a deep love, a deep hobby, a really wonderful thing that you're into, those are people who don't ever grow old. I started with Mrs. Bigelow. I'm going to have to move out in front. She was the dressmaker for Jenny Lind, who came here to sing in 1852. And she was from Northampton, Massachusetts. And we so rarely acquire photographs of women in outdoor dress. And she has, she was a cloak maker and a milliner. And she has one of her own homemade bonnets on it. And it was about 1851 that this was taken. And the trimmings inside that bonnet were even. Later on, it would be done on one side, and you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, that is a long cloak with the cape attached, and it's a fairly long cape, a really warm winter garment. This lady is wearing a, uh, uh, a chemisette, which is like a dicky, but it ties around the waist and fastens around the neck or around the shoulders, and it's always kept pristine and could be changed under the dress. And that is called cadet style. And while it looks as though she just got too big, she's not big, and let out her dress. That was a style, and a high style, given that silk dress. It wasn't just uh, for every day. And that was called cadet style. And I have, um, probably didn't bring it, um, a slide of an 1850s cadet, military cadet, with his jacket buttoned here and here and his smart white shirt sticking out there. Uh, this is a woman in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and she is close to 1850, but still wearing the 1840s most common style that de descended into house dress and lasted well through into the 50s. It is cut with a lot of freedom in the front pieces. The back is very tightly fitted over the corset. Oh, want me to tell you about the 1840s corset? Up to 1853, women wore a very tight-laced corset that had a pocket down the center, and a wooden or bone, whalebone busk shaped like that and out around the belly went from your collarbone to your pelvis, and you sat straight or you'd get a bruised pelvis. So that's what she's wearing. It did wonders for posture. <laughs> in the 1840s, the sleeves were cut on the bias, and they were cut very narrowly. They often had cap sleeves on the top. And you can tell the 1840s by their small collar treatments. This is an interior stand-up collar, but some of the 1840s collars came over and were no more than an inch wide. In 1850, those collars changed to about that wide. So that's a perfect dating tool. The hair changed to, uh, in the early, and, and even mostly through the 1840s, at least part of the air, hair was co uh, covered. I got to quickly tell you how they did their hair. They parted it down here, and it was long, all long. And so they brought the long hair forward, and they raised up the back hair into a bun right about here. And they either made braids or a coil or a bun. And then this hair was combed down straight to the face and then looped up and the ends tucked in so that it came like this over the ears. And into 1852, 53, 54, they stuffed it. And wait until you see what they did with it. <laughs> and these, this little girl on the left has, she's about 12 or 13, possibly her first dress that is down, I'd say, uh, midway down the calf. This little girl, her dress would be just below the knee. Oh, and remember, no, no hoops until 55. This is another example showing more clearly that the dress was made over that corset, and often a ribbon belt was pulled over and pinned with a brooch right at the point. I want you to look at the fabrics, too, because these are what went into the old quilts. And I'm sorry that I didn't have time to show you the 30s, because a lot of those fabrics got put into 40s and 50s quilts, as you probably can realize. Um, the wide ribbon, see the small 40s collar yet? Um, 
so we won't get this is a either a slave woman or a free woman a house slave was dressed in um, fairly nice clothing I would say she was a free woman and this of course is long before the war and she's wearing eyeglasses she's possibly a seamstress and you see the you can't tell that it's on the bias but cuffs too were not merely cuffs they were usually sleeves attached about the elbow and then turned up over the, the dress sleeve to keep it clean that was the function of the collar too over the corset they wore a chemise which kept the corset clean from the dress and or no I beg your pardon under the corset they wore their chemise and they put the corset over it protecting it as much as possible from perspiration over the corset they wore a corset cover and then their petticoats all went on six to eight petticoats in the 40s and early 50s now you can see this bust crushing corset it forced the breasts out under the armpits as much as possible and the man is wearing a sack coat of the 40s and the bright vests and sort of wide ties his isn't as accentuated as they became a little bit later in the 50s and men's hair was down over part of their ears as well uh, that's not her bun that's a comb stuck behind the bun in the back of her head to fan out a child in just a simple homemade dress and isn't that fabric wonderful and and haven't you seen a quilt somewhere with it I think so I really do it looks so familiar so in the 50s just beginning uh, waist length not the long point of the 40s and this child not old enough to wear a corset is wearing just a waist length cotton day dress and this is the Whig Rose quilt that was made from the 1830s and through the 40s and through the 50s and even the 60s and it is applique and I love them but my very favorite quilts are patchwork ones with the old materials this is a very beautiful quilt no doubt a prize winner in a fair this young woman while she has the tight corset wears a pelerine over it and the more ribbons you had and they were expensive probably the wealthier your family and her hair that she brought forward was not looped up and back but in young women it was often curled down before the ears in long ringlets long sausage curls and that's another way of dating but that goes up into the 50s pretty well and the crossed ribbons with the brooch and you can count on it there's a crossed ribbon at her waist with a brooch and a pelerine this one is fastened down the front with a bow more ribbons uh, wealthier sometimes around both wrists this is lady whose name I've forgotten who was a cook in Savannah for many many years and this is her daughter and uh, Leticia and Leticia was the personal maid for her owner and made many trips to Europe with her and this was taken about 1850 not quite 1850 with the narrow collars servants were dressed in plain chintzes with repeated small patterns because they shed the dirt and the servant always looked spick and span and proper and Letitia became a great favorite of her owner even on a young woman like this who's probably 16 you can almost tell there that her hair is folded back and it's still very close to the head in the 40s it often covered the ears or part of the ears and was quite close to the head it wasn't until 49 that it started to get padded out are you going to remember all these details <laughs> that's why I wrote it down for you <laughs> oh also in 46 the sleeves begin to shorten and get a little fuller see their back further on the wrist and then an under sleeve was worn under them and they were attached up at the elbow by tacking stitches this is an Indian woman in Wisconsin and she married a Canadian a Scottish Canadian fur trader and she ran the Green Bay fur trading post for him because he was always up in Canada getting furs and so on and they had several daughters 
three of whom graduated from college. And she stayed home and took care. She was a Winnebago woman, Ho-Chunk now they call them. And she put on her mother's Indian belt and bead jewelry and the tin dangle earrings, tin cones. And I just love that face. I just love it. Um, Native women turned to uh, Western fashion very, very early and worked in homes and worked in stores. This is a little boy. And one quick thing, you can tell little girls from little boys, even though little boys have dresses. This is not a dress, he's older and wears a smock and trousers. But little boys wore dresses. But you can tell the difference. Girls had their hair parted in the middle and boys to one side and combed over. So that's a wonderful clue. This shows you how this style gathered in and not so long because she's not wearing that long pelvis pointed corset anymore, pel pelvis poker. And, and this is her house dress. She's not even wearing undersleeves. She just has a little print house dress to keep clean. And bonnets by older ladies were tied tight under the chin. By younger women, they were loose. One didn't don a bonnet until one was married. Um, and then one was even worn under one's bonnets, straw bonnets and hats. Very few hats, just bonnets until the 1860s. This is a mother with just a plain dress and you see how the sleeve is cut and the gathering goes over the shoulder and the seam is back here. In the late 1840s, she has a comb in her hair as well. I love this picture, I love it because it's right close to 52. And that woman's bonnet is still an 1852 bonnet. She brought it with her out to the gold fields. And she knew the photographer was coming. She probably rode out with him. So when she brought her men's lunch that day, she dressed up in her best silk dress, <laughs> which is a touch, maybe a year out of style. And let me tell you, if you were a woman under 40, you didn't let your style go back, your style for your dressy clothes, get five, ten years old. People say they did. They did not. People in Dakota, in the Dakotas, people in California, people everywhere got at least Godey's Ladies book shipped in, and sometimes girls ganged together and paid um, ten cents a piece. Ten of them ganged together and paid the dollar a month to get the current news. And when they bought a little bit of yardage for a new dress, do you think they made it the old-fashioned way? I have told so many men that, and they have just said, no, no. They didn't know what style was in Wisconsin. They didn't know what Goldie's Ladies book was. There were bears here. <laughs> that, I was told that by my, by my director of the society. I said, who did your research? <laughs> This is Frankie French, or uh, Johnny French, I beg your pardon, with little Frankie on his lap. Now their story is wonderful because here's Jenny, his wife. Nope, I'm sorry. He turned his back on the photographer who must have been a buddy. And he says, my God, turn around and show the people that hairdo. So that's Macassar oil. You, know, you heard about Anna Macassars? It was so the men didn't get the hair oil on the chair. And they combed it, divided it down the back, not very evenly combed it forward and brushed around the ears and wore his top hat and his dimple. <laughs> My mother thought he was the sexiest thing alive. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the early 50s collar, still a holdover from the 40s with the peaks jutting up in a wide ascot tie. Johnny built the hotel on Mount Holyoke and he worked 20 miles away from his wife in Northampton, 19 miles. So he only saw her about once a month or so because he had to ride his horse. And so they wrote back and forth. And there's all this correspondence. I would love to do their family story. And here's his wife, Jenny. In a dress which she made, and I can tell you, it is orange with red dots. <laughs> and orange silk trim, light orange silk trim. How do you know that? Pardon? How do you know that? From her letters. It's marvelous to have that documentation. 
I would dearly love to be still be young enough to go to Northampton if that silly curator hasn't sold it. Out. He has sold all their daguerreotypes. Okay, don't, don't get me started. <laughs> this is their little girl, Frankie, who was said to be very spunky. And her mother had, and her mother had to whip her little behind every once in a while in the long pantalettes of the 40s in a little dress which her mother made, which was a little long-waisted, so it's getting to be kind of late 40s. Oh, this is, I beg your pardon, this is 50s. Uh, it's about, uh, in 52 she had her a picture taken with her dad, so this is 53 or 54. By 1855 the pantalettes were just below the knee. And this is the album quilt from this collection, appliqued, but of solid materials, chosen especially for quilt making. Uh, very rarely, and I would love to see it, do you see appliqued quilts with little printed appliques. Uh, I like to see that, but these are nearly all uh, single colors. This gorgeous quilt is in this museum. I love this young woman who has the open sleeves of the early 1850s up to about here, and she's beginning to wear the mitts, which left the fingers bare, and they were either of sheer net or of a very fine silk tatting. And when you see people working in a historic site and they've got thick cotton crocheted gloves on, it's wrong. <laughs> and she's wearing her hair in the curls. She's a young woman. Certainly, I would say 18, wearing a Delenn dress of wool, which is sheer and it's summer material because it wicks moisture. Silk dresses were for winter. You could pad them and they were windbreakers. This is a family which came to near Madison, Wisconsin. It's the Sigel Cow family from uh, Prussia. And this man, who is in an 1860s US Army uniform, was burned into the photograph later. This picture was taken in 52, the year that they left Germany and came to live on the outskirts of Madison. And German, Swiss, French, Dutch, Russian, Irish, South American, South African, the styles were the same. You cannot tell them apart. They all got the French fashion magazines and Western style went, Mexico, Western style went everywhere. Canada, um, there were little differences. In, in Canada, the women around the house wore moccasins. Um, uh, little differences in Mexico, maybe they would borrow the lace shawl style from the Spanish girls, but the styles were the same. And one achieved, let's say, ladyhood by being in style, and it was very uncouth to be very, very out of style if you were under 30. This young girl doesn't have much money, and she has a very plain dress. This is the first bishop sleeve we see. Bishop sleeves have been around since the 30s. It's not always gathered at the shoulder. The early ones were not, but it is gathered into a cuff. And the small collar of the 40s, and her hair is done rather high. Uh, it's a difference of a uh, year or two in the 40s. This is, a, or in the 50s. This is a 50s pair of girls, sisters, with the waist length belts and bodice and skirt gathered in. And this kind of sleeve, about this long, which was not proper for ladies except for parties. There's a party dress <laughs> of a very sweet little girl. Now, this is fun because it's early 50s. And that's a bustle pad. And you don't think of bustles till the 70s and 80s, do you? But there were little bum pads. And if you didn't wear them, the skirt might tuck in behind your knees because all you had under it were petticoats, not hoops. And if you wore that, it threw the skirt out into a pretty silhouette. And you could walk around looking like a hollyhock. <laughs> I, I, beg, I beg your pardon for the one postmort that I have here, a postmortem photograph of a uh, little baby who has died. But otherwise, I would never get to show you the uh, wrapper 
because a woman would never be seen in a wrapper. I say this woman had the photographer come to her home and photograph her with the baby as a record, what the baby looked like. This is a woman from Green Bay, Wisconsin, who had enough money and had a friend who ran a big store up there. And when he went east to buy clothes, she'd say, buy me a dress. Now, I want it to be uh, one of the new large plaids in green and cream. And I want you to buy this kind of silk fringe, and so on and so on. What she meant by a dress was the yardage to make one. And she would have her dressmaker make it at home. And she would have him bring uh, uh, collars. She would order the kind of collar she wanted. Usually not lace, but white work, meaning white embroidered on white. Uh, and this is uh, a very lovely hairstyle with uh, ribbons tied in the back and the ends hanging down. She's, she's in her 20s, Mary. I can't remember her last name. And she has a very full undersleeve under the very full uh, a pagoda oversleeve in two layers of 1856. And her hair now is padded quite far out, but not as far as you're going to see. <laughs> two young girls, not very um, wealthily dressed uh, in ordinary clothing. This little girl wearing mitts. This could be a, um, a graduation or something. They're dressed up. Um, and lots of children and lots of servants wore that kind of dress with the small print. I don't know why that girl looks so sad. And a family, a farm family from Wisconsin, I think. And um, it's very plain that the 1850s has changed things grossly. It was 1850 before there were buttons down the front. 1853, really, because, well, 50s it started. But the corset still fastened in the back. By 1853, they got rid of the pelvis crusher, and they made a short corset, very curvaceous, and brought the breasts more to the front. And this kind of dress then was buttoned down the front and not fitted to the torso so tightly. And there's the wide 50s collar with this time a tatted or, or crocheted edge. And boys wore often checkered or plaid shirts and ties tied like their dads of two-inch wide ribbon and horizontally worn. And the man is wearing a sack coat of the 50s, very loose, uh, loose and roomy in the sleeve. And the little girl is wearing a short-sleeved, square-necked dress, uh, proper until you're about uh, 14, but the length would change then to um, halfway down the calf. She's still wearing the long pantalettes. So this is before 1855. It's probably 53, 54. Uh, these are the parents of the Ringling Brothers. And this is a made-over dress with different sleeves put in. And it's closer, really, to 1860. Uh, it's very late 50s. I don't need to say anything about that, except to say that that's another Delenn and probably peach colored or yellow with black braid and her little mitts. But oh my goodness, is she bored. But, <laughs> but the stockings, and look, her little, her little high boots are soft kid, and they're very tight around the ankle, sweet little boots. And she's wearing a coral necklace, which was a betrothal gift. I mean, I, I beg your pardon, a uh, christening gift uh, from, oh, a grandmother or someone close. Oh, I love her. I love her. I'm sorry to say her working title was Miss Ugly. <laughs> but, dear heart, she has almost no teeth and a cocked eye. And she's obviously, I think, a washerwoman because of her large, hard-working hands. And that isn't a separate colored skirt, I believe, because I think it's a, an old 1840s dress cut up to make an apron. And the big bishop sleeve of the 1859 and on into the early 60s with a cap sleeve over it um, is very roomy for servants and for people that have to really work with their arms. And her cap is very tight over her head and tight under her chin. 
but I think she'd be a very loyal worker. And here's another one. Isn't that dear? This, I think, is either a governess or a housekeeper, something like that. And, boy, she looks like she'd just snap right out and do anything to serve you. What may I do next, ma'am? And you can see that a lot of the caps were undone, so she might not even be 40. And this woman is certainly 50s or 60. And yet, do you notice a hoop? It's after 1855. She still does wear a black widow's cap. Uh, but that some women wore till death. And the dress may or may not be black. Yellow, green, even pale green, red, and orange were black to the Daguerrean camera. So if you see somebody that looks like they're wearing a black dress, don't think it's mourning if they have a white collar especially. Mourning may it meant that you bought a, gray, a black crepe collar to wear over your white. This is a smock unbelted over a young lad approaching 1860. Uh, another very common style of early 1860 is a cuff, like a gauntlet cuff. And she's wearing a hoop. And the collars became small again in 1860. So that's a really fast clue for you. And the hair went down the back of the neck, behind the ears. We would call it a page boy, and it nearly always was contained in a net. Uh, this is Frankie. Um, French. <laughs> Frankie French again. And that's what happens. There's a colander going around and things drop out the holes. <laughs> <laughs> and these show three different party dress styles. This was her birthday, her 12th birthday. And these show three different party dress styles. And you see this girl is wearing the match to Fanny's bracelets. They often wore two. And she has loaned one to her friend. Now, can you see that this woman has trousers? It was not called the bloomer at this time. Earlier on, the larger, puffier legs, sometimes in white, uh, were called bloomers. But in this style of uh, reform dress, usually the women were without corsets, and they had cut plain trousers out of the same material as the dress, probably from what they cut off of the dress. And she is from our home on the hill in Danville, Massachusetts, which was a health resort, which guaranteed to cure you or give you your money back. And they said no coffee, no alcohol. Um, I do not know, I cannot discover what else they restricted, but I think there was very little red meat. And they guaranteed that you would get better from many, many ailments. And I guess women did. They loved it. And they went there and stayed there for whole summers. This is the co-owner. Her father founded our home on the hill. And she is wearing a beautiful 1868 tunic over a very short skirt and pipe stem trousers. And she has her hair cut short which is very, very audacious. And here she is wearing a watch chain like a man. But they did not dress like men. They wore fashionable uh, ascots and ties and jewelry and bonnets. Uh, they just wore short skirts so they could stride out. This is a woman who came down to the US from Canada. And I don't think she's 40. She simply lost all her teeth from bearing children. And she's about 1863 when the bishop's sleeve was very large. Will you note that the arm's eye, you who sew, you know that the arm's eye is where the sleeve is set in. The arm's eye is down here in the 60s, straight across, so that when you cut a sleeve pattern, it's straight across at the top. It doesn't come up like this. And that is deeply gathered to give her lots of room. And it's waist length, and she'll be wearing a hoop under that. Prior to the hoop, as I said, six to eight, nine petticoats. Charming girls in the late 60s out in California, and these little quilted jackets, it's quilted of that material. Doesn't look like it because of the black quilting. 
and uh, these little bolero jackets and shirts with uh, uh, this is the curved coat sleeve style that men wore. And these are 16-year-old girls. I love this picture. I have never seen one of a black nanny that didn't have the saddest face. They put these girls into the service tending the babies when they were 11, 12 years old. And they stayed nurses till they were old ladies. Um, they were much beloved by the children. And they were nursemaids. But they were dressed like the furniture in the house to show off the owner's wealth. Um, at this stage, he no longer owned her. He hired her, but trust me, it wasn't for a very great wage. House servants dressed up, uh, field servants not. This is an 1868 or 9 style when the braid accents the yoke and she wears those ringlet curls down the front and something new, the first hat you've seen. Um, it doesn't, I haven't photographs of enough bonnets. They had women take them off, they shaded the face. Um, but Hats were not worn until the 1860s, and then only for holidays um, down at uh, the beach, um, to watering places. Um, but this is a young girl who adapted that little forward tilting hat, and I think she wore it more often than that. And checks and plaids were very big in the late 60s and early 70s. Now I love her, but... She's too old for that hairstyle. <laughs> and either that or she's really an ugly teenager. <laughs> but isn't that a dear dress? And the corset made her just as attractive from behind as any other girl. And it's a charming dress and very, very late 60s with that yoke outlined in velvet ribbon. Here's one from 1870 when the hair was pulled back more and up and large jewelry was worn, cameos and big black um, bog jewelry, and this brilliant, heavy, contrasty plaid uh, was very popular. I love pieced quilts. And this is square and square with flying geese borders. And that belongs to this museum and oh, look at the checkered patterns in there. Look, so many. And you know what I hate? I hate quilt packets that come with granny prints. They did not make the early quilts all out of teeny prints. They did not. They cut the pieces of larger patterns and put them in very, very directionally and geometrically. And I admire and love that because that quilt carries a long distance. It has its fine art. This is Juliet Gordon Lowe. Who was she? Girl Scouts. And she was a kind of naughty little girl. She had cut her bangs with the scissors just before this picture, <laughs> which was taken about the, the very early 1870s. And she has a, a two-piece dress, which comes over, and then the skirt folds up underneath it. And she has a little bustle behind. And the young man with his high boots wears breeches down below the knee. You can't see what he's wearing as a jacket. I'm sorry, the uh, quality of the slide isn't quite up. This is a couple of uh, four girls who just graduated from school in Portage, Wisconsin, which is where John Muir was born. And it's a very small town in, in mid-northern mid Wisconsin. And um, they have dresses, no, no doubt, made at home by loving hands. And uh, they have the curved sleeve of the 1860s and 70s, which was always called the gentleman's sleeve, because gentlemen's coats hang like this on a hanger, because the upper part of the sleeve is cut with a bend, and then the under part is narrow and cut with a bend, and the under part goes under here. And the oversleeve is wider and goes here, so there are two seams in the sleeve. And so those are gentlemen's coat sleeves. And lots of ruffles were in order in about 1873. And 
um, very tight corseting still, um, and very fancy hair, pulled up. And a little bit later, it was really famous to muss it all up. Percy. Well, I show you Percy because he took his jacket off, and it shows that there are buttons on his shirt, and they button to his pants waistline. And his mother has slicked back his hair, which wouldn't you rather see it all tousled? But I just think that's the dearest picture, and one of the only ones that kind of tells how a boy was dressed. This is a, a family, a Norwegian family from northern Wisconsin. We had a Norwegian, or maybe southern Wisconsin, I beg your pardon. We had a Norwegian photographer, Andrew Dahl, around Madison. And he began photographing in about 1873. And it shows some wonderful things. Uh, I think those three girls, and maybe that one too, have dresses cut from the same bolt of material and made it home. And uh, this girl uh, is wearing a little bit older style, uh, probably 1870. Um, and the young lad wears a sack suit and carries his straw hat, which is another telling detail. And that's the pork pie crushed hat that the man is wearing, and he's wearing a sack coat. Um, it's uh, sometimes the Norwegian, well, you'll probably see. This is the typical expression on the Norwegian photographs. <laughs> that's a Norwegian mama and papa. And the two girls. <laughs> where early 1870s dresses cut from the same bolt of material, obviously, and made it home. And she is wearing an older dress, which hangs very long. She had to put a rock on it to keep it from blowing in the breeze. Uh, believe me, Norwegians were proper. This is a photograph which I used early on in my hard work to get my society to let me develop patterns so that we could use them on, in our outdoor museums on the interpreters. Mm -hmm. Because I said, they wore old, they wore bustles. And that's when they told me, there were bears here. They didn't know <laughs> styles in Wisconsin. And I wonder what bears had to do with it. <laughs> um, and the women would take out the bustle and shorten the skirt to feed the chickens and the hogs. That was one of the things they asked me. What did they wear to wear the, feed the chickens and hogs? This is Lottie Crabtree, the actress. See what I mean about must up hair? She spent hours doing that. <laughs> uh, the bangs come in about 76 and go on through the 80s. And pleasant. Rowell and Frouchy, who did the dolls, put bangs on all of them, even the 1850s and 60s, before I could stop her, because she's from my hometown. And she got her costume ideas from my museum and gave me a lot of money uh, to clean up the children's collection. Um, I love this photograph. The, the curly bangs now are very frizzed. And this is very close to 80. It is 80, with the apron overskirt dipped up here over furniture ruffles and puffs, um, and lots of little cartridge pleated cuffs and ascot ties of lace. Oh, I love this too. Again, portage. Again, the long sack coat of the um, 60s and early 70s. And again, the ruffles on the skirt and the men's coat sleeve. And I think this is either a wedding or an engagement photograph. And yes, these were from small town Wisconsin, and there were probably bears there. <laughs> and I love this. Every chance I got, I tried to get a minority. I have an Inuit woman, um, at least one Chinese woman. Um, Any time I could get black women, I went to Savannah, and they were so kind to me. And they went all through their records. I'll show you some of those. But this is the Basque bodice that was called a cuirass because it was like the cuirass of a coat of armor the way it was fitted to the corset. And a bustle drawn up in the back and with a pad that tied around the waist and was a frame that had bones in it that stuck out in a long tube down the back. And then the material was gathered so there was a slight train. And it was very graceful walking. 
another one of my beloved favorite uh, log cabin type quilts from this collection. Now, a log cabin probably started earlier than people realized. It was a good way to use up woolens and make a warm cover for a winter bed. And the amazing amount of patterns that can be created with these straight little bars. I, this is just it's like a light reflecting out. This is a girl, a very young girl, maybe 13, maybe 16, in an early 80s dress with the apron pulled up again over uh, pleats instead of ruffles, the long cuirass bodice, and her hair done up tight. They often pulled it up skinny. Uh, she hasn't gotten to the bangs yet, but she had, Black River Falls was a a backwoods uh, lumbering town. This is these, I believe, are a graduating class of girls from a young women's seminar in about 1883. Uh, there's too much to describe in that, and I don't want to be late. Um, 83. And this shows you what happened. This is the bustle of 83. And it's a, it's a common day dress, and it might be a year out of fashion. But this was much more common around the house. Just a waist length dress that buttoned up the front, very modest, with a very narrow sleeve, and now a very high arm eye, and a small collar. And that was practically the, uni the everyday uniform of most women. Oh, they are the uh, switchboard operators in Hartford, Connecticut in 83. This is a farm family in Wisconsin, and those collars are crocheted, and they date to about 1884 to 6, and the young man is wearing a sack suit, and the little girl at front is wearing just a little plain straight frock. Notice her striped stockings. Children wore striped stockings pretty much throughout the 19th century. This is Marietta Stowe, Marietta Bell Stowe. She was married to a man named Bell. When she was a young woman, she helped Mary Todd Lincoln in her uh, homes and her charities for Civil War widows and orphans. And she was very wealthy. And when Mr. Bell died, they had no children, so she inherited. Well, she went on a speaking tour, and she moved out to Oakland, California, and was a thorn in everybody's side because she fought for equality for women. Up until the 90s, a man had control and could sell his children. He could disinherit his wife and let her go to an old people's home when he died, or when, uh, when he died and leave everything to a son, and if, if the son didn't take care of her, she would be on charity. And she fought for equal rights for women, Marietta Stowe, and she ran for vice president in 1884, and again the next election term, 86, I think. All she did was cut her fancy 1883 dress short, and raised it up and made silk trousers. And she's just as fancily dressed as any other woman, only probably not wearing a corset. And we owe her, ladies. We owe her big time. Yes? Was it Stowe or Stowe? S-T-O-W-E. No. Marietta Bell Stowe. Oh, I had to show you this. I don't care. These are 1880s cloches on a sister and little brother. And she is dressed in the, uh, now I won't be able to think of it, that fancy style. There were, there were books and cards with the um, long dresses and the elaborate collars and, and those bonnets. Kate and Greenaway. Pardon? Kate Greenaway. Kate Greenaway. Thank you, thank you. Another hole in my colander. And uh, I'm sure those kids hated to see those pictures dragged out. <laughs> but could I miss them? No. And these two girls have their heads poked through a photograph, a photograph of the artistic women. 
And it shows that they made fun of the artistic costume. But lots of kind of wealthy women like to wear it and have artistic tees. Isn't that just precious? And that just shows you an 1886-87 bustle and the way it was fitted and the way it was worn and the hair was done uh, in Richmond, Virginia. And now we get in in the 80s and 90s into crazy quilts, which were not made to keep you warm in bed or to keep you warm really at all. They were made to be thrown over the piano or the couch in the living room to show off your talents. And they were as often embroidered as not over. And um, uh, there's a great charm to them, great, great charm in history. Uh, I forgot to tell you my feeling about early quilts. They called them mud work in Wisconsin and throughout the Midwest because in the winter you could get out on sleighs and visit. In the summer, of course, you could go on the wagon. But when it melted and it was mud, and it was a couple of months of it, you would go mad if you couldn't do something creative. And that's when they did most of their handwork at home and created their beautiful works of art. But you've heard of Mother Hubbard's? That's a Mother Hubbard over a pregnant body. And in the extension of this photograph, Letitia's second son is in the picture and her whole extended family. And they told her, Letitia, you will too be in this photograph. And she doesn't like it a bit. <laughs> uh, you can tell what the hats began to be like in the 1880s. There were bonnets, very small bonnets, and tied tight under the chin. But a hat, this was taken out in front of the house on a summer day. And in 1900, the census of the city where this was taken in California shows that they had four children. So her three sons here, and that was a boy she was carrying. Uh, oh, I think this is great. Of at least uh, possibly mother and daughter and son who must have just won the prize for best attendance at Sunday school. <laughs> In his sack suit and knee length trousers and, and socks and two different styles of the early 1880s, this little high apron was a very popular style. A big, great variety in the 80s, but the sleeves were narrower and the shoulders were higher and um, the corsets were equally tight. This is a young 16-year-old girl in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, another lumbering town, wearing what's probably a made-over dress I love this. There was a wonderful photographer in Richmond, Virginia, who loved the servants in town and the black people. And here they are, I think, by a fairgrounds or a racetrack or something, dressed in their Sunday best. And you can see the pride. You can see the hats and the bonnets, but a lot of hats. But that's a bonnet. No, that's a hat. And the men's sack suit styles buttoned up closer. And I love that girl over on the left. She has a goofy look on her face and probably was, uh, let's say, educationally uh, challenged uh, because she always has a goofy grin on her face. But they are very well dressed and very proud. And this style is sort of late 70s, so they're somewhat a little bit behind in dress. Sometimes their employers gave them their better dresses. This is a Savannah portrait of a family, so handsome. I really love it. Um, they're very well dressed, and these are all house servants, butlers and housekeepers and maids. Uh, they were so good to me in Savannah, helping me. Oh, I love this one. And it says up above there, 1991, and it's the, oh, it's up above there. And it's the um, iron workers' picnic. And they're holding bottles of probably beer. But I want you to look at her sleeves up there. You see those little, remember Cupid dolls with their little wings? Well, these are little toots up on the top of the sleeve, right at the point of the shoulder, right straight up. And that's 1991 and, uh, and a not later, and a not earlier. And it's always a fun detail to find. You don't find it in everything. But the hats, the coats, 
um, the men's hat styles and the sack suit styles are all early 80s, or uh, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, I beg your pardon. Um, and this is a wonderful document, but you can't see it that clearly. This is a, quote, beloved school teacher in Savannah. And she is very well dressed with a famous uh, parasol with a curled ivory handle and her tight little corset and trim sleeves and high collar and pleated skirt of about 1892. And another sort of combination patchwork um, uh, quilt, I mean uh, crazy quilt, with padded pink silk roses in the center. Uh, very beautifully embroidered, feather stitched, and just marvelous patterns chosen for those pieces. This is another school teacher from Savannah, um, about 92 when the sleeves began to be puffed. And in 90, later in 92, they made a ball almost at the top, not quite. In 93, they were great big sloppy ones that came down the arm and still had a tight arm below that. In 94, they were even bigger. In 95 and 96, they came out so far that somebody invented a, a sleeve hoop. And he got it ready in 1896, and the sleeves all collapsed in fashion. <laughs> But this is a perfect little 1890s dress with a velvet cut, cut out velvet uh, bodice, you know, the acid cut velvet. These are girls in Kingston, New Mexico, girls and a, or, and a woman, in the 1900 style when the sleeves still had high puffs and there were a lot of bodices and skirts worn and big full collars. This is the wife of Charlie Van Skoik, another story I would love to tell. He was the self-appointed chronicler of the town of Black River Falls, and I'll show you one of his pictures that absolutely tells his personality at the end. This is his wife, and she stopped by the studio in their winter clothes with their daughter and a friend, and probably bringing him some lunch. This is his wife again with her mop. Uh, she was out to scrub the back porch of their house. This is his wife again at camp. She's the cook, and she wears a canvas camping outfit and boots. And they stayed in that tent for a week or two while the husbands fished, and she stayed home and did the cooking and, and cleaning up around camp. These are girls in Hartford, Connecticut in 1893, uh, most of them have the big full sleeve of 93, and they work in a machine shop, and they had to wash and starch and iron those things. But there's something about, that's women. They aren't going to go there and look like sloppy men in smocks and <laughs> trousers. No, sir. This is the milliner in Black River Falls, and she has branches out on her porch with her hat trimmings on them and some of her Easter bonnets. And her children are there, the little boy with a wheelbarrow full of hat trimmings. And her daughter is astride the horse because the black, or the uh, stables is right next door. Wouldn't it be lovely to have a horse stable next to your millinery shop? <laughs> this is Charlie. He just wanted to chronicle the whole darn town. Uh, this is out in uh, California in 1894 um, or 5. And... This girl still has a slightly earlier style on, and it's very revealing. This is the most up-to-date, with that starchy sleeve and that tight belt with the big buckle. And it was to show people what went on on a ranch. In, uh, and he's got his uh, young calf there, a cattle-raising ranch in California in 1894. These are women in 1895 at a cemetery, decorating the cemetery on the 4th of July in Black River Falls. That's Charlie again. This is a woman in California. This is as bad as it got. <laughs> How are you going to put a wrap over that? This is a wonderful photograph from 
Atlanta. And it was in the Atlanta newspaper. And it was to advertise how, how much bicycles were used, bicycles were used. And this is not yet a bicycling outfit, uh, but the girl's bicycle was made to carry those hoops. This I love. It looks like she hammered that little comb <laughs> down into her skull. But that's a homemade dress with her homemade silk stitching and the big sleeves of 93. And Dad, I think that's a wedding anniversary photograph. And I adore it. That sweet face looks like my grandma. How about this? Washed, starched to within an inch of its life, and ironed. And her waist is so small, you can't believe it. That's at least an 18-inch waist. So she must just have graduated. She's quite young, but she's a nurse. Uh, another nursemaid. I'm going to go a little faster. A very famous photograph of actresses going up to the Yukon and walking. Uh, and they have a couple. There's a man and an older woman as chaperones. And they're wearing their corsets and their big sleeves from 1895. Uh, but they're going up for the gold rush and they're wearing trousers. And um, that they made a good living up there. This is a Norwegian couple from Wisconsin, and you can tell that it is 1896 by the date on the fair sign. And there's that Norwegian woman striding out ahead of her husband, just as bronzed and tan and strong as he is from working on the farm. This is a woman who has just cooked a chicken dinner out in New Mexico for everybody, and everybody else has gone to town and left her home. And she just made a new dress, too. Um, Another lovely, lovely black family, dressed very beautifully. And especially the man and the two boys went into the uh, uh, army. Those are uniforms in the Mexican War. OK, wrapping up. I'll just go through these. Pre another pregnant woman. OK, that's Charlie's personality. The end. <laughs>